A first since the military crackdown in Myanmar, a government minister tours a refugee camp in Bangladesh home to one million Rohingya. They have given him a list of 13 demands before agreeing to return home. So how will the government respond and how committed is it to resolving the crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. For the first time since Myanmar's military crackdown that led to a massive refugee crisis, a government minister has been at a camp for Rohingya in Bangladesh and the visit sparked a heated exchange. Social Welfare Minister Win Myat A met with about 40 refugees at the Kutupalong camp in Cox's Bazar, but they became angry when the minister reportedly said they must accept national verification cards and say they are migrants from Bangladesh. The refugees say they belong to Myanmar. About 700,000 Rohingya have fled violence in Myanmar since August and are now living in overcrowded camps. Bangladesh and Myanmar agreed their repatriation should begin in January, but there were delays because of security concerns for the refugees returning home. The minister has been trying to reassure them repatriation is a priority. I really appreciate the government of the Bangladesh for your uh, for their support uh, to, to, to come here for us. And uh, now the, the the meeting is very successful, and uh, we know about uh, or actually we already know about these conditions. And uh, the most important thing is the to start the repatriation process as soon as possible. So if the, the, we 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 can overcome the, all the difficulties. We can overcome. Well, that will take place. Yes. They want citizenship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are trying, trying to have the citizenship. But the Rohingya want to be recognized as citizens of Myanmar before the repatriation starts, and they want their security supervised by the United Nations. We want to make our demands known that we want to be called Rohingya refugees and not called Bengalis. The Burmese government has committed genocides before, leaving us stateless. We demand justice for that too. So the refugees have issued a list of 13 demands before they say they'll return to Myanmar. They include the closure of all IDP or internally displaced persons camps in Sitwe and the Rakhine region. The recognition of Rohingya as an ethnicity and restoration of their citizenship, return of their land and property and the release of all Rohingya who've been imprisoned unjustly. Well, let's bring in our guests now for today's Inside Story. In London, Ton Kin, president of the Burmese Rohingya organization in the UK. In Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, is Shelley Takral, spokeswoman for the World Food Program. And also in London, Laura Haig, Amnesty International's Myanmar researcher. Thank you all for being with us today on Inside Story. Ton Kin in London, if I can start with you, how hopeful are you that these demands uh, by the Rohingya, including the restoration of citizenship, will be met by Myanmar's government? Uh, I think uh, we have to look at uh, how the systematically Burmese military and government been doing the Rohingyas is quite a long time. And we, uh, as far as the way the attitude towards Rohingya, it's been, go, it's been gone about six months now, eight months now, where more than 700 Rohingyas fled from Burma to Bangladesh. So we have not seen any attitudes where Rohingya have changed at all. And I have, uh, I can see this uh, uh, Minister Wimnya a visit is a kind of public relation to ace international pressure to show to the international community. And this is, he is the person who uh, mentioned, who accused that Rohingya burned their own homes and they ran mm. without any evidence. That's what he mentioned. So um, it is just a show to ace international pressure and uh, the way the government attitude is not changed. I don't think uh, this is uh, just uh, any practically they want to do anything because uh, the problem here we need to look at is still people are fleeing, threatening, right. extortion. Uh, in Burma, in Rakhine State, what is going on? We need to look at that before they are returned. But you know, Tunkin, that is you quite say, important. Tunkin, 
sorry to interrupt you. You say this is just a PR campaign from the Burmese government, but the government seems to be taking some steps, is it not, uh, to resolve this crisis and, and even ensure justice. We've seen recently uh, seven uh, soldiers uh, put in jail for uh, crimes committed against the Rohingya. Is it not uh, a first step? Is it not a good first step already? Do you think they're not genuine about the steps they want to take? Because... Uh... If you look at that, is you know two reporters who rebuild these uh, uh, these atrocities to Indian village, you know, uh, it's been rebuilt by two writers reporters. They've been arrested, and uh, it's already uh, you know international level or quite well aware. That's what they want to cover up. What they did, massive you know atrocities. They want to cover up by you know uh, jailing only seven soldiers. So we we are looking at here, you know, ICC Rafa. There is many soldiers, but, uh, you know. But you haven't so answered my question, and, Tunkin. Uh, you haven't answered my question as to why you won't trust the government. Because the, this Burmese government is uh, denying all the atrocities. Why they are not allowing fact-finding mission? Why they are not allowing international media? Why they are not allowing humanitarian aid access if they are sincere? Mm. This is my, my question to you. Okay. Let me bring in Shelley Takral now in Cox's Bazaar, uh, Bangladesh. Shelley, the WFP uh, for which you work for is only one of two organizations that have been allowed uh, in uh, Rakhine State. They've been allowed access to Rakhine State. Can you tell us about the situation there? There right now, what your people on the ground are telling you are, are conditions ripe for some of these refugees to start returning. So what I can tell you um, is really about uh, more about the conditions that are that are occurring in the mega camp in in mm -hmm. um, The refugees continue to arrive, um, not on a daily basis, but at least on a weekly basis. We've we've seen something like five thousand uh, Rohingya refugees arrive in in 2018. So my understanding is, is that when you ask people, do you want to go home? Of course, people say we want to go home. We want to live in our houses, but we only want to go if it's safe. Uh, we only want to go if it's if it's uh, if, if it's our will, if, it, if it's up to us. You know, nobody wants to to be forced uh, to be forced back to, to to homes where they really don't know what to expect. Uh, you know, you, I've been here for more than eight months now. And, and you know, and every day I see this camp grow larger and larger. It's a city. We call it a mega camp. It's overcrowded. And as you mentioned, you know, land is um, land is a premium. And we're working against the time right now, against the clock for, uh, for monsoon preparedness. So there are, yes, you know, while there are political cards on the table, so to speak, you know, the conversations um, that are occurring and, and, and sort of various uh, parties that are involved in different discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, our immediate focus is, you know, how do we ensure that the 688,000 people, many of whom are children, um, mm -hmm. continue to receive food? Mm -hmm. We probably have a potential public health uh, outbreak, a disease outbreak on our hands, you mm -hmm. know, with heavy rains. Right. Um, Possibly cholera. Mm -hmm. So you know this. This I think you know we yes we, we need to sort of really focus on on the immediate situation of how we can ensure you know that people people are safe and people are out of harm's way and, and and more immediately you know we're looking to sort of you know make sure that they're moved from some of the the hilltops you know right. the images probably that you have been across our screens and and in our newspapers for many many months of, of, of this. Of, of, I'll ask you a bit more about the sort of preparations you're making, uh, Shelley, ahead of the monsoon season. But I want to bring in Laura now in London uh, to talk about the, the recent moves by uh, Myanmar's government, this uh, minister's visit. Do you think Myanmar's government is ready to accept these refugees? Are they genuine about taking steps in addressing this crisis? Well, I think it's a step in the right direction that a Myanmar minister has actually gone to Bangladesh and gone to the camps. There is still a feeling within Myanmar that a lot of this crisis is exaggerated. So I think having a member of the government going to Bangladesh to the camps to see the scale of this crisis, to hear what the Rohingya have experienced, what they had to flee, what they've had to flee, is an important is is an important move. And of course, to talk to them about what they want in this conversation about returns, no one is actually asking the Rohingya what they want. 
want. Mm -hmm. Is the government serious about uh, repatriation? But they have issued this they list of 13 demands uh, to, to the government minister uh, that you know, includes, of course, uh, recognition of citizenship. Do you think any of these demands are likely to be met by the government? Um, in the short term, I think no. And I think we do have to see that this push for repatriation is very much a, uh, a politically expedient agreement that was being reached between Myanmar and Bangladesh. Myanmar is under a lot of pressure um, from the international community. There's a lot of talk about international justice and accountability. They need to see people starting to return to Myanmar. The reality is, at the moment, that is not safe for the Rohingya to do so. Rakhine state is an apartheid state. The Rohingya is segregated from the rest of society. They can't move around freely. They can't get to hospitals, to schools, and they can't leave the state. And of course, they don't have citizenship. And what the government is offering them is essentially a form of citizenship that isn't actually citizenship at, at all and won't come with a lot of the rights that the Rohingya demand. Tun Keen in London, uh, Rohingya have been repatriated in the past because unfortunately this is not the first crisis to, to affect uh, this, this minority. Uh, there have been other um, uh, exoduses and there have been other repatriation. Why is it essential for you that the demands that uh, the community has put forward this time are met? What's different this time around from previous crises? Uh, in the previous crisis, these Rohingya refugees returned not as a citizen of Burma. And if you look at current crisis, where 700,000, the largest exodus ever we have seen, and on top of that, they burn down and they destroy all Rohingya villages, and they are building a giant prison camp, and they are... Uh, they are, uh, they are, you know, calling the Rohingya refugees uh, to go back their homeland without, uh, there is no guarantee of any rights. Mm -hmm. So how could this can happen this time? Because this is uh, international community much well aware what's happened, where mass atrocities being committed by the Burmese military before they are returned as far as what we know. We want justice and, you know, there must be guaranteed all the rights and also safety, security. We, we need a protected return to protected homeland, you know, because uh, currently what we see in the past and now as a whole Burma, you know, Burmese military, USDP government, NLD government, and militaries and Buddhist monks, they do not want to see Rohingya as a citizen. Mm -hmm. Is a very, very a strong hate speech against Rohingya in Burma. They do, and Rakhine Buddhists too, they do not want to see Rohingya as a citizen. They are telling the Rohingyas are illegal immigrants. They right. are saying so, that. So, so you don't think the mentalities have way, changed at all? Uh, Any time these people can face any time these people can face mass atrocity again in Burma when they return without any protection. This is what my uh, point and also citizenship and other protections is needed. And on top of that, where they will return, their houses and villages being bulldozed, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it is no point to return to the giant prison camp to go for okay. uh, Rohingyas this time. So we hear you. You say the conditions are, are not ripe for people to start returning to Myanmar. I just want to show our viewers now where this crisis is unfolding. About 700,000 Rohingya have fled Myanmar since August to escape violence. And the majority of them settled in the district of Cox's Bazar near the border between Bangladesh and Myanmar. The Kutupalong camp hosts the largest number of refugees, more than 50,000. About about 46,000 have also settled in host communities like Ukia and Teknaf. Uh, Shelly Takral, um, I know you've been working a lot with people on the ground and you mentioned the upcoming monsoon season that you're very worried about uh, what's going to happen. Uh, the conditions in some of these camps in Bangladesh are already very deplorable. So what sort of preparations are you making ahead of what's likely to be a very difficult season for these refugees? Yeah, no, it is a race against time, and um, and to you, and to basically just to highlight, these people have come from Myanmar. They're very used to cyclones. They 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 probably lived on flatter, uh, more agricultural land. But what they're not used to in Cox Bazar, in this mega camp, is living on the side of a hill, living in shelters that are um, very temporary, very flimsy. Um, with a, any kind of touch of heavy rain, you know, these this this will just slip away. That they're, they're when you talk to them, the biggest concern for us is, is trying to, A, make um, land usable and flat and safe to relocate some of the families which we've identified in, in what we call a red zone. So that's something like 150,000 uh, 150, people. But 
when you do talk to people, they have no concept of, of, of what it might be, uh, what a flood might look like. So mm-hmm. it really is, it's, it's really about, you know, not, these guys have been through so much already. Right. Um, and, you know, for another potential disaster to be looming and another fear of having to move and, and, and having to sort of, you know, seek uh, refuge on safer ground, some of them will move because... We, we're telling them that you know it's not safe to be where they are. Some of, some will move on their own, but it, again, it's you know it's, it's very, it's a very, um, it's a very difficult time at the moment just to get everything in place. Right. Um, we have a cyclone which season which could be um, anything between the next three to four weeks, right? And then monsoon in in by by June. And I wonder, uh, Shelley. I mean, you know, we we talk about how the Rohingya have faced decades of persecution in Myanmar, and, and the most recent crackdown has forced uh, them to flee in unprecedented numbers uh, to Bangladesh. I mean, this crisis has happened before, but it's unprecedented. The scale of it right now is unprecedented. I wonder how are the host communities in Bangladesh coping? How is the government coping? What sort of help are you getting from the authorities there? No, it's a it's a it's a really good point because one of the um, key factors in all of this is to really try and alleviate any tensions um, that might grow between host community and uh, the Rohingya refugees. Obviously, there's a lot of aid, there's a lot of attention um, on the mega camp. You know, we alone are feeding 882,000 people every month on food in kind. But one of the things that not only agencies like um, like ours, like the World Food Programme, but other agencies, we work very closely with host communities on livelihood projects. So working with women to ensure that they can maybe set up a shop, have a small loan. Um, you know, people are doing tailoring businesses. Um, so that's that's really um, the key. Really, is, is is to make sure for the. 300,000 host communities that, that are here, and, it, and it's not a particularly affluent area. It is a, these people crossed into a poor part of Bangladesh. Um, you know, money is money is scarce. People talk about you know the the, the job market being competitive, mm-hmm. food prices having gone up. So that's really something that we need to work really closely with our host community, with our partners, and the government of Bangladesh as well, to ensure that there there are cash. Um, Cash for work programs or food or, or, or certain programs that we can, you know, help really sort of, you know, um, ensure that uh, there are, you know, a, a, a limited tensions as possible between or between the host community and, and uh, the refugees. Okay, Laura, I want to come back to a point that uh, uh, Tunkin made a, a moment ago when he talked about the conditions not being there for these refugees to start returning uh, to Myanmar. You've said that, you know, the government has been making some positive steps, but I wonder, does it have a clear plan for the Rohingya once they return to Myanmar? Obviously, they're, pa- they're facing a lot of pressure from the international community, but is there a plan in place uh, from the government, do you think, to, to accept these people back? Um, I mean, I would actually, sorry, correct you and say I, I actually don't think the government has been making that many positive steps. I think it's positive that the minister has gone to Bangladesh, mm-hmm. but when you look at what's actually happening in Rakhine State itself, you know, we don't just have this system of oppression and discrimination, but in the last few months, the government has been bulldozing homes, has been starting to rebuild. Now, the government says that this is to welcome the new returnees, but what our research has shown and what satellites show is that actually new security bases are being built on former Rohingya villages. The area is being increasingly militarized with new helipads. Uh, The reception centers are being built on uh, former Rohingya villages and homes. Um, And it increasingly looks like the Rohingya, if they go back, would have to live side by side with the very same security forces that submit, like, that, you know, basically enforce a campaign of death and destruction on them. So it's it's not safe for them to go back at the moment. And the government is not giving the impression that that is going to change anytime soon. And that's something that's further underscored by the fact that today, yes, we had the, 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 the conviction in the case of the Indian soldiers, right. um, seven of them sentenced. But ultimately, this is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what the Myanmar security forces did in Northern Rakhine State. We're talking about crimes against humanity. We're talking about crimes under international law. Mm-hmm. The government so far is unable and unwilling to investigate, to prosecute. And this is why, as Tunkin says, we need that ICC referral. Yeah. We need international justice. Right. The ICC is taking steps towards investigating the atrocities committed against the Rohingya. But Myanmar is 
not party to the Rome Statute, this limits the ICC's jurisdiction, does it not? How are they, how are they going to, to go about investigating these crimes if Myanmar's government doesn't cooperate? Well, so the uh, prosecutor of the ICC has actually um, requested that the court, just this week, um, has requested that the court actually provide clarity on whether or not the crime of uh, forcible deportation um, would would be something that would fall under the court's jurisdiction because the Rohingya community have actually arrived in Bangladesh and crossed an international border. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh is a state party to the Rome Statute. Right. But actually, it doesn't need a court ruling for that. What it needs is for the UN Security Council to refer the situation to the ICC um, much more pressure on the Chinese and the Russians to, to allow for that, much more pressure from the US, the UK and France as the, the permanent members within the UN Security Council. But what about the crimes that were committed within Myanmar? How would, how would they go about dealing with that? Well, again, this is this is why we would need a UN Security Council referral. Mm. Um, the, the sort of territorial ju jurisdiction that the um, court is seeking in Bangladesh, you're right, would only cover one specific crime. Yeah. However, that is, I think, a, a positive sign that the ICC is looking at ways in which it can prosecute these crimes. And I think it sends a very clear message to the Myanmar authorities that the international community will pursue justice for what happened to the Rohingya, and all avenues should be explored. Let me bring in Tunkin on that. Uh, Tunkin, are you hopeful that the international community will go all the way, that will pursue justice and, and seek answers for these horrific crimes committed in Myanmar? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's a long way to go, but my point here is as a Rohingya myself, you know, 700,000 Rohingyas are in Bangladesh refugee camps right now. And where is their future? And monsoon rainy season is coming. And inside Rakhine State, where about approximately 500,000 Rohingya uh, people are still, they are facing atrocities uh, in their daily life by their Burmese military and security forces. So the point here is our people are day by day, you know, weakening and the situation, refugee camps uh, might get worse in a few months time, you know, mm -hmm. where I heard, you know, from reliable, so 109,000 refugees directly will affect, more, uh, you know, landslide and uh, flooding in coming months. So, yeah. so are you the saying point that for you, we can for you, the Rohingya people, this is much more priority. Okay, uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Is the priority, priority when we are pursuing for the justice. So you, you, you don't think the priority right yeah. now anyway is uh, investigating these atrocities and, and uh, you know, ICC cases. You think the priority should be on the people who no, are no, suffering no, right no. now? Uh, uh, no, no. Priority is same time we have to pursue justice. We must bring those responsible, uh, you know, those who committed genocide against Rohingya must bring to the ICC. Same time mm -hmm. we must look at, you know, how we can protect Rohingya refugees inside Burma and in refugee camps. This is right. also same time we must focus. But coming back I mean, to the ICC, priority. coming it's back not. to the ICC, just specifically on that, do you think the, the international community will step up? Are you hopeful that the international community will uh, put even more pressure on Myanmar's government? I think it's very important that international community have to work quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, coordination and also we, uh, you know, we have a strong evidence where committed genocide against Rohingya and Amnesty International have much more evidence and Human Rights Watch and others. So we must move on more stronger way to advocate mm -hmm. those countries, uh, you know, to bring them uh, to refer ICC referral in the US, UN Security Council to Burma. That okay. is what we need to do. Okay, Shelley, let me give you the last word in Cox's Bazaar because obviously that's where the problem is right now, a lot of it anyway. Uh, we've talked about the situation there. I wonder uh, about humanitarian access within Myanmar. Has there been any improvement on that end? I mean, again, I, I, would, uh, I would echo what, what both, your, uh, both the other guests are saying, is, is that at the moment, um, you know, the priority is, is is making sure that there's a voice for these Rohingya refugees, that we give them immediate support that they need now. And mm -hmm. for those that still remain, um, you know, yes, we do we do need to keep the pressure on. We do need to make sure that you know this the that you know that there's no more risk to this to to this human life. And um, and that and that if that means you know just continuing as we are now in in this emergency, right. uh, doing everything that we can to make sure that you know that they have 
you know, what they need okay. um, to be safe um, and to live a di dignified life. Thank you so very much for a very interesting and enlightening discussion. Tun Kin, uh, Shelley Takral and Laura Haig, thank you all for being on this edition of Inside Story. And thank you as well for watching. You can also watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Of course, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Batibo, and the whole Inside Story team, thank you for watching. Bye for now.